Neil Gaiman's Sandman was the first piece of art that I was intensely interested in. The first thing that affected me so powerfully that I was driven to understand why. I owe so much to Gaiman's sweeping epic about the Lord of Dreams. It started me on a path that's led to here. Dream, or Morpheus as he's most commonly called in the series, has done the same for a lot of people. Indeed, when Gaiman made his lead character the personification and master of dreams, he played on both meanings of the word, the visions we have when asleep and the wishes that consume us when awake. There is so much to explore in Sandman, and I may do more on this, but today I want to zero in on the unique place that William Shakespeare has in the series, and how his presence helps Gaiman communicate some themes about writing, dreams, and genius. Shakespeare makes three appearances in Sandman's 75 issues. The first time we see him is toward the beginning of the series in the context of another person's story. Dream and his sister, Death, make an agreement in a 14th century tavern when they overhear a man saying that the only reason people die is because everyone does it. Death agrees not to take this man, Hob Gadling, until he desires it, and Dream agrees to meet him in the same bar once every hundred years to discuss how he's feeling. On their second meeting in 1589, Dream and Hob overhear a man named Will Shaxberg pining to his friend and fellow playwright Kit Marlowe about his great wish to give men dreams that would live on after I'm dead. So Dream strikes another bargain with him, the details of which we learn on their second meeting, this time on the South Downs of Sussex, England, where Shakespeare, traveling with a troupe of players, is preparing his new play, A Midsummer Night's Dream. This play, we learn, was written for Dream, one of two plays about dreams in exchange for Shakespeare becoming the figure we know today, the vessel for the great stories of mankind. Shakespeare's troupe are enticed to perform for the real inhabitants of Fairy, who are visiting the earthly realm at Dream's invitation, perhaps for the last time. In the process of this story, which takes place toward the middle of the series, Dream begins to question if he was right for giving Shakespeare what he wanted. He did not understand the cost, he says. Mortals never do. They only see the prize, their heart's desire, their dream. But the price of getting what you want is getting what you once wanted. Here we begin to see the purpose behind Shakespeare's inclusion in this series. Through Shakespeare, an analog for Dream and Gaiman himself, we get a meditation not only on genius, but on the cost of genius. For Gaiman, that cost is isolation, isolation of all forms. In this issue, we meet Hamnet, Shakespeare's son. Shakespeare seems to regard Hamnet as a nuisance, and Hamnet laments to another actor, he's very distant. He doesn't seem like he's really there anymore. Not really. It's like he's somewhere else. Anything that happens, he just makes stories out of it. I'm less real than any of the characters in his plays. In his eagerness to write great stories, Shakespeare becomes isolated from his family and his life, such as the cost of extreme focus. But works of genius also become isolated from their context. At the intermission of the play, Dream breaks the news to Shakespeare that his friend Christopher Marlowe has been killed. The timing is no accident here. The rise of Shakespeare, beginning with plays like A Midsummer Night's Dream, signaled the disappearance of his contemporaries like Christopher Marlowe from the historical record. In modern cultural memory, barring academia, their presence has been overshadowed by isolated genius. The Gaiman picks up this theme again in the final appearance of Shakespeare in Sandman, which is also, not accidentally, the final issue of the series. Here, Shakespeare is writing his final play, The Tempest, the second play at the end of his career that fulfills his bargain with Dream. His friend and sometimes critic Ben Jonson comes to visit him and asks about the new play. Have you been raiding poor Hollinshed again, or does Plutarch bear the brunt of your depredations? This, of course, references the fact that Shakespeare famously took many of his plots from prior sources and histories like those of Raphael Hollinshed and Plutarch. Yet these sources, like small planets like Christopher Marlowe and Ben Jonson, do not register against the massive star that is Shakespeare. An example. Back in the first issue, in 1789 at their fourth meeting, Hob Gadling tells Dream he has seen a production of King Lear mentioning, 
the idiots have given it a happy ending. That will not last, Dream says. The great stories will always return to their original forms. Here, Gaiman is playing with us. He knows what the average man, epitomized by Hob Gadling, does not. That it was Shakespeare who changed the ending. The original versions on which Lear was based did have a happy ending, but those versions are forgot. And yet, by having Dream say the great stories will always return to their original forms, Gaiman indicates perhaps the key theme of the whole series, the power of dreams to supplant reality. In the second issue, Oberon, King of Fairy, watches Shakespeare's play about himself and says to Dream, but things never happen thus. Dream responds apropos of this theme, things need not have happened to be true. Tales and dreams are the shadow truths that will endure when mere facts are dust and ashes and forgot. The very next panel features the line from A Midsummer Night's Dream that criticizes the power of stories. The best in this kind are but shadows. Well, Gaiman, like Shakespeare, disagrees. These shadows, these illusions of reality, incomplete as they are, may come in time to replace the real thing. Indeed, Shakespeare was the vessel for extremely powerful stories. His treatments of culture, of love and madness, in many ways created the age we still live in. We are all, in a very real sense, living in the dreams of Shakespeare. Sandman is a singular work of art coming and propelling comics into a higher literary appreciation, and pulling, like Shakespeare's work, on a vast catalog of mythological, religious, and literary references. It's fitting that Gaiman is more interested in Shakespeare the man than his work. Shakespeare, Dream, and Gaiman, like I said, are all analogs for one another, and each in their turn have to examine the costs of telling great stories. The largest part of that cost, it seems, is isolation. I watched my life as if it were happening to someone else, Shakespeare tells Dream. My son died and I was hurt, but I watched my hurt and even relished it a little. For now I could write a real death, a true loss. In three issues that span the series, Neil Gaiman treats these themes of genius and isolation within a larger framework of a story that is essentially about stories. The inclusion of Shakespeare highlights the uneasy relationship between stories, collective dreams, and those who create them. History and imagination amend Shakespeare to fit their purposes, just as Gaiman does by bringing him to life in the pages of Sandman. And Gaiman imagines him isolated from his own life, as history has isolated him above his time and place. Even as we make our work, our work makes us. And it can obliterate us, too. In other words, dreams really do come true. Hey, everybody, thanks for watching, and welcome to everybody who is new to the Nerd Writer, that Inside Out video. I can't believe so many people watch that. That was just an awesome experience last week. Um, but this is a great example of the kind of stuff that we do here at The Nerd Writer. We take art and culture and science and politics and explore them and go in depth and put ideas to work. And that's what this is all about. Um, and the channel is made possible by your pledges on my Patreon page right here. Um, as little as a dollar per video. You know, the money that you guys give me goes directly into these videos. Um, and to, toward improving the channel. And that, that is really what I wanna do is push this medium farther, you know, create new styles, new ways of exploring and explaining ideas. Um, and there's a lot more that I wanna do. This was awesome. I've been thinking about how to analyze comics for a long time. Hope you enjoyed it. And anyway, thank you again and welcome to the Nerd Writer. We have a lot of fun here. Um, I will see you guys next Wednesday.